It's almost Christmas, guys. It's almost Christmas. Santa Claus is coming to town. Did you say Santa Claus? Santa Claus. Uh, no, I said Claus, but Claus would be cool. Yeah. Like Qua- a Quasimodo Santa Claus is a hunchback? Yeah. Or Kwanzaa. <laughs> are, we, are we live? We're live. Oh, we're live. Okay, we'll get back on topic. What's going on, guys? It's Tech Tuesday, and it's been probably about a month since we've been on, and we missed you guys just as much as I know you missed us. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about off-road shock tech and all the little deets that no one's going to tell you. But in order to talk about those deets, we got to go over to Justin Smith. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate the introduction, you guys. Uh, apologize we have been gone. Uh, we had the Baja 1000. We had a couple other events in the dunes and things like that that kind of got in the way of do- us doing feeds. So apologize, but uh, we got to it as quick as we can. One of the things that we hear from a lot of our customers is that they wish we would go back and get deep into the technicality of different subjects. And So we decided we'd go a little bit deeper than we normally would on the inside of a shock absorber, specifically off-road. Why? Because that's what we do. And number two, that the theories behind how this stuff works are completely different between an on-road shock uh, or bicycle shock or, um, you know, any road race shock compared to off-road. It's almost opposite. So we're going to get into some shaft speed stuff, balance, pressure balance, uh, maybe some of the pressure numbers. Um, if you guys are, are up on it, then we'll get right into that. So one thing that um, a lot of people talk about is shaft speed. Well, what is shaft speed? That is typically measured in inches per second, and that is the shaft movement of the shock. So our little cutaway that we drew up for you, this shock shaft portion that you see on the vehicle at all times, as that compresses in or out of the shock, That speed is what we're talking about when it comes to inches per second. What does that translate into? Well, shaft speed comes from the fact you've hit something, right? Steve is thinking- Shaft speed always comes, Justin. That's (laughs) right. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it does. Apparently in Steve's world, very, very quickly. Um, But the shaft moves because you've hit something or the vehicle has, right? Or you've driven over something rough. Um, the bigger it is, the faster the shaft can move. The faster you're driving when you hit that thing, whatever, that obstacle, whatever it is, the faster the shaft speed is. And the faster the shaft speed is, uh, typically the higher the pressures can be on the inside of the shock or pressures that will be seen on either side of the piston, base valve, or other valving inside the shock. Well, what is shaft speed equal when it comes to obstacles? So well, this is kind of a layout for you guys to get an idea. Believe it or not, a G-out, now what's a G-out? We, we have, that's a word that we've kind of um, invented in the Southwest for the dunes when you're going from bowl to bowl and at the base of a dune uh, as you fully compress the car and typically you're going to bottom it out, drag the skid plate there and you need a lot of compression force, a lot of spring to stop you. That's a G out, uh, G forces, right? Well, a lot of people consider G outs to be like jump landing. So it would also be something that would bottom the car out. That's actually not very true. G outs are a very slow shaft speed event. Um, Meaning that as you come into something like that and it compresses the car and bottoms it all the way out, drag the skid plate and your back is pissed, that's a very slow shaft speed event. So between 10 and 20 inches per second is typical for most G outs. You're gonna find out why that's a problem here in a second. Chop and chatter, anywhere from 30 to 50 inches per second. Um, rocks, small stuff that you're, gonna, you're hitting, like saying desert type rocks and you're hitting fast. Small whoops, like one foot and smaller, between 50 and 100 inches per second. When you start getting the speeds up, that's big stuff. So we're going to get into whoops that are two, three feet tall as you're going through them at 30 to 80 miles an hour. Um, and the highest shaft speeds you'll ever see are a sharp edge at high speed. So driving along on the trail, you're doing 60 miles an hour and it's a rained out rut that's cut the trail away. Maybe it's two feet across. It's got a nasty ledge on the other side of it and you just blow right into that, ba bam! That's pretty much the highest shaft speed you're gonna see is that type of a thing. Usually round whoops don't give it to you. G outs definitely don't give it to you. Um, Chop and chatter you think and we feel is fast. Well it is, but it's a very small location when it comes to the shaft movement and it's also not moving the shaft very far. So high shaft speeds over a long distance move a lot of oil. Shaft speed in a short distance, back and forth does not. 
So it's not a consideration for um, what we would, you wouldn't call chop and chatter high, uh, really high shaft speeds, certainly not according to this list, right? One of the things that's very, very easy to tune and control when it comes to shaft speeds are, is the valving that's on the piston. So if you look at this drawing, piston on the end of the shaft, and there's some valving on both sides of that. And I've got an example right here, which might be a little hard for you to see when you come in a little tight. But this is a valve stack, pretty normal valve stack on the rebound side of the piston. These valve shims bend out of the way to allow oil to flow through. There's another valve stack underneath the piston and a bottom out washer. This is the compression stack. So as this shaft and piston extend and compress into the oil of the shock, oil is forced through the piston, opening the valve stack and oil moves around the bottom out washer and continues on. Justin, can you do that hand motion one more time? I just I, need another demonstration. Here you go. Is that, <laughs> that quick enough? <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad to have helped you out there, Steve, even for just a short time. Um, what's a bottom out washer, you guys might ask? Well, this bottom out washer is designed to stop the compression valving from opening at a certain spot. So, as oil comes through, bends the valve stack out of the way, that valve stack stops on the bottom out washer in essence giving you a maximum amount of flow that the compression can, can see, which also in, when it comes to seat of the pants, um, that, would, uh, that would be a slow compression ramp up to a, uh, all of a sudden you have a ton uh, of compression resistance and dampening due to a bottom out washer. That's a one tuning aspect of what you can do with valving. You can stand this off, of the, off the stack. You can bring it closer to the piston to bring in more bump stage. All of this valving, on this piston is velocity sensitive, meaning the faster that this moves up and down, the farther this valve stack opens, the stiffer the valve stack be becomes. And that is a tuning aspect for velocity sensitive systems or shaft speed. So this valving on this piston can control chop and chatter feel. It can control rock small whoops, it can control even some of the bigger whoops and sharp edges because most of these are shaft speed dependent. But in the one spot where the shaft speed is as low as possible and this valving is probably not gonna open, you have a big G out that you need to stop the vehicle from bottoming all the way out. That's when shaft speeds go away and the necessity for position sensitive dampening comes in. Now, position sensitive dampening means that at a certain position, inside the shock, dampening is changed or controlled. So in the middle of a bypass shock, for instance, um, you have all the bypass ports that are controlling some of the feel and dampening. You have a uh, piston valving that's controlling some of the dampening and ride quality. But as soon as this piston passes the last bypass port inside this shock, it gets into what's called the bump stage. This bump stage is position sensitive. It only happens <laughs> at the last few inches of compression. This area does not come into play when the shock is moving throughout normal use. That's position sensitive valving and that's when valving on top of this piston and on the bottom of this thing become very, very important. As this gets into that bump stage, um, that can be a big factor as to how you're gonna stop the vehicle from bottoming all the way out. So, we've gone over Piston valving, shaft speeds. We've gone over uh, position sensitive valving, which would be a bump stage or something that is controlled via uh, the location of uh, bypass ports or other things. Also, we have dampening potential in the adjuster. This could be a um, DSC, single stage, dual stage, whatever it might be. But let's take visual aids. Here is the top cap or, uh, of the shock with an adjuster inside of it. If you look up inside of here, Steve, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's a port at the top and that directs oil through the bridge and into the reservoir. It has to pass by this valving and piston adjust on the adjuster. That sits right there. Well, when you adjust this assembly, what you're doing is you're giving resistance to the shaft displacing oil inside the shock. All right, well that sounds technical. I'll, I'll dumb it down a little bit. If this shock, 
did not have a reservoir on it, and it was just full of oil, you couldn't compress it at all. There is no way it would be completely hydraulically locked because the shaft is coming into that body um, and into that oil area. Steve, I know I got you again. <laughs> <laughs> That, that shaft is trying to displace oil, and the oil has nowhere to go, so it's hydraulically locked. Um, as we allow oil to leave, and I've got oil drawn past, uh, oil flow drawn, and this is red, oil leaves the main body of the shock going through the bridge, past the adjuster, and into the reservoir, where we have a piston, nitrogen on one side, and oil on the other. This passage of oil back and forth through this adjuster is equal to exactly the displacement of the shaft. So if this is a one inch shaft um, and it's moving in by one inch, the exact amount of shaft size displacement is exactly the same amount of oil that's moving into this reservoir. I know, and I've got Steve in the back, he can't stop laughing, but. Um, so this adjuster does not necessarily place force on this piston like piston valving does. What this adjuster does is it stops the shaft from coming into this assembly. You can control it by stiffening or loosening, which opens and, and closes the flow, which allows that shaft to move in faster or slower, which makes Steve very happy. Yes, Steve? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin, can you manipulate the valving on the DSC? That's kind of hard. Come on in real close. You can see a little bit on, on this. So the valving that's sitting on top of this DSC piston is the rebound side. The rebound is not controlled. It's also not adjustable on this system. This is what's called a rebound pop-off valve stack. So I can lift this by hand very easy. There's only one little spring holding it. So anytime the rebound uh, oil goes through here on the rebound stroke, this valve opens immediately. There's no dampening force whatsoever. On the bottom side, that solid stack, it looks like a solid washer, is all valve shims. So basically this is extremely stiff. The, the forces and pressures that are on this system are very, very high compared to what's actually on the main piston. Uh, this has much higher force involved. What was that, Mitch? Did you have something? I'm sorry, I thought you were raising your hand over there. Just waving. Yeah, waving. So this adjuster prevents or allows the shaft to displace oil. These, this valve stack on the piston prevents or allows this piston to move quicker or slower, which is what you feel on the seat of the pants for sure, but typically in the mid-stroke or in the bump stage, that's what this is gonna do. Now, one thing we've written on here that's very important, piston plus ba base valve, that's piston valving plus base valve, equals your total dampening potential. How stiff can this shock get? That is determined by these two things added together because they control different items in the shock. So more adjustment on this base valve, a larger flowing base valve, possibly stiffer valving on the base valve, um, larger piston, bigger diameter shocks, more valving or less valving here are the two things that add up to what you're controlling and able to tune from the compression side. Rebound is only controlled by the valving on the piston in most shocks. There is no rebound control on most adjusters unless it's an X2 shock, which would be an adjuster on the compression side and another adjuster on the rebound side. Um, the new Pro R's or Turbo R's, you've got a live uh, di or dynamics um, computer controlled system which has dual adjusters, both compression and rebound, and that is definitely um, controlled uh, much better than most shocks with a single adjuster. Did you have something, Dom? Oh, no, not yet. Okay. Another thing while we're in this, uh, area of where valving is controlling th different things. Here's a bypass tube. So this is the cutaway we've drawn with some bypass ports on the side of it and the piston in that area. Um, these are bypass ports. Normally valving is sitting on, bolted to the side of this and that valving is pushed open uh, to allow for flow. Um, the size of these ports and the location of these ports are what control the plush ride quality that you feel it's one of the things that controls plush ride quality that you feel in the UTV or any off-road bypass style shock. But this valving right here is not really something that's a tunable item. I mean, stacking different size shims or thickness shims can control a little bit of it, but ultimately uh, what co controls the most of that is port size and port location. Moving it around to where it's in the proper zone where 
this piston is basically riding inside that bypass area for the majority of its life. Looking at this, if this was on a car, you only have three or four inches of shaft showing on this. That's kind of the bad area to have it. We want to have a little bit more shaft showing somewhere in the 60% range, 40-60 40, range. And you want to have those bypass ports right along the, the area where this piston is going to use them the most. So, locating these in height is extremely important. That's why we have blank tubes here that we uh, machine up and we can design and locate bypass ports in different zones and heights uh, inside the shock to tune it for your use. Well, why would you want to do that? What if you run your vehicle taller than most? Well, you'd want those bypass ports to ride a little higher on the uh, zone-wise. Uh, maybe it's riding a little bit lower, like a short course vehicle, we want those bypass ports a little lower as well. If you add a ton of weight to your UTV, then that piston is going to sit higher. Maybe this is the stock location, but you add a bunch of accessories to your car, and you don't do a spring kit, you push that piston up too high, it comes up here and bangs right off the bump stage, which is super stiff, right away. So even though you add a ton of weight and you've lowered the vehicle, normally you'd think it's way soft and it would bottom out really easy. Well, it might because you don't have much ground clearance, but it's gonna ride super stiff because that piston's in the bump stage at all times. So having a location of these bypass ports is super important. The size of them added up gives you total flow, which is kind of a, a tunable thing when it comes to ride quality as well. Um, shaft speed uh, does not affect that. The bypass ports are open pretty much any time uh, that you're gonna move the piston through them. Um, so that is not a velocity sensitive thing. That is something that you wanna tune. Um, what is though is total flow of the bypass ports. You know, if you choke down the hole, then it's gonna go right to the valving on the piston, which can be stiff a little bit quicker. So there's always these overlaps of things that we wanna to tune together. Piston and base valve added together, total dampening. Rebound is, is piston only on most uh, systems unless you've got uh, two adjusters, one for rebound only. Mitch, what do you got? Uh, going back to the, the RAS thing and the bypass tube, Cody wants to know, so with that, do you guys replace those bypass tubes with different hole locations? Is that included in your RIS package? Well, it depends on the vehicle, right, Mitch? Um, yes, you know, sir. A, lo a lot of UTVs don't come with a bypass. Some of them do. A bypass equipped UTV, we probably have 50% of them with tube options. And we have different tube options for different needs. So if you're racing, we're gonna have a different tube package than, you, than a play car. If it's a dune only car, we probably have a different tube package than a guy who's just doing rock crawling. So um, check with us on your vehicle to make sure a tube is an option. Um, we do have tubes that are coming for Pro R's, Turbo R's, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, we've got new tubes in all of our test cars. We've just been putting a lot of miles on them and see what we like and don't like before we give it to you. But tubes are in development for just about everything. Check on your vehicle with our guys. Or just ask Mitch when you're here, right, Mitch? Perfect. All right. Either way. <laughs> um, rebound is piston only unless it's a double adjuster or like an X2. Um, shaft diameter affects the adjuster range. Here's what that means. Since this adjuster is controlling the... Uh, ability of this shaft to come in and out of the body of the shock. If this shaft diameter is larger, then more oil is moving through that passage than a small shaft diameter. So the adjuster has to be designed to control those oil flows, which means that the adjuster is going to have more range if it's got a larger shaft moving more oil. So it's also one thing that, for instance, like Fox has done, is gotten away from 5.8 shafts on a lot of things and gone 3 quarter to 7 8 minimum because you get more adjustment in that upper adjuster, which is nice. And that's something that we, on certain tunes, adjust that, that so that you can get more range out of the adjuster as well. You have something, Steve? Um, Davido61919 hmm. said, please address using damping and dampening. Dampening is making something wet. Damping hmm. is suspension tuning. Yes, Justin. You're, you're right, but I use the slang term all the time because I'm lazy. God, DeVito. Da damping, DeVito. Damping is the right way to say it, uh, and he is right. So good job for pointing that out and making me look like an idiot. I like that a lot. <laughs> Mess <laughs> message me and I'll send you a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> good one. Um, now, um, we talked about locating those bypass ports in different areas. Adjustment range of, uh, can be affected by uh, shaft diameter. 
Um, what, do you, what do you need for a shaft? Well, that has to do with vehicle specifics, how, how heavy the vehicle is, how hard it's gonna be driven, um, uh, the intended use. So if you're gonna be running through three foot whoops and jumping it off of buildings, then a stronger shaft is required. Typically, shafts bend when they're fully extended out of the body, which would be you in the air, vehicle tires off the ground, and you come down and land so hard that this shaft with no support in the middle has no choice but to bend right in the middle where it has no support. If this is halfway into the shock body and it's supported in the middle by the seal head, it's very hard to bend a shorter shaft right here. So almost always shafts have failures when they're fully extended on a big jump landing. Typically, that's a mistake when you've driven your UTV off of a cliff and you bend a shaft. That's not something you wanna do, but that's usually when it happens and why it happens. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, Mitch, did you have something? Um, kind of. Uh, TFD Wookie wants to know, can you talk about nitrogen PSI and how often you need to check it? Okay, so uh, I'll just tell you that nitrogen PSI, is, unless you have a leaky shock, you should check it once a year. Um, we do it every race, we do it every trip, but we're also shock guys and have nitrogen handy, right? But if your shock's not leaking, it's typically not an issue. Once a year is fine. PSI, depends on shock diameter and depends on manufacturer, but 150 to 200 PSI is pretty much standard issue for a shock that's two and a half inch diameter to say three and a half. You get into four inch diameter shocks, it's gonna go up to 225, 250, 300 PSI, something like that. Um, we'll go into nitrogen right now and what that affects. A lot of people think it does one thing, it actually uh, does the, almost the opposite. But nitrogen, why, why do we have nitrogen in this shock? Dom and I were talking a little bit earlier and uh, the question was, hey, we charge this, this uh, reservoir up with nitrogen and a lot of people think that that is just so that it pushes this piston and oil back into the shock so the shaft can come back out. Well, that is, it's not true, but we can see how you would think that because when you charge a shock, typically the shaft's gonna come all the way out as soon as you have pressure inside of it. Well, the job of nitrogen isn't just to push the shaft out. Nitrogen pressure does a lot. Well, one of the things it does is it puts the oil under an atmospheric pressure that keeps you from hydraulicing or um, cavitating, sorry, not hydraulicing, keeps you from cavitating the oil. So if you were to run this piston through the oil as fast as possible, let's just say 200 inches per second, what would happen if you didn't have enough pressure on the system is that it would develop pressure above the piston and it would, it would cavitate the oil or separate the oil from itself on almost a molecular level. It's gonna tear the oil apart, creating a vacuum cavity inside that oil that immediately shuts as soon as the pressure comes back onto the system. 200 PSI, 150 PSI, um, there's reasons for both depending on how much oil is moved and how fast and how large the piston is and, and shaft diameter, how much oil is being displaced. But what you never want to see is a pressure imbalance in the shock due to tuning. So you can change the valving on this piston in such a way that when you hit something hard and the shaft speed is high, that you could cavitate the oil behind the piston and overpressurize the oil above the piston. And that is called a pressure imbalance. You always want to have a shock that is in pressure balance. Pressure balance. There are different zones inside this shock that can see different pressures at different times. The area below the piston, the area above the piston before the base valve, area behind the base valve into the reservoir. Let's oversimplify this and call it three different areas, three different zones. If you hit something hard and the valving on this piston is not correct and the base valve valving is too stiff, for instance, too much valving on the compression side of this piston, too much valving on the base valve, and you hit this hard, pressure is gonna go from 200 PSI on this oil to four, five, 600 PSI pretty quick. We're talking milliseconds, and this may only happen just for you know, a, a millisecond before the valving on the base valve opens. But when this pressure goes up, this pressure behind the piston goes down. And if this pressure behind the piston drops below your nitrogen pressure of 200 PSI, let's say it drops down to 190 or, to two, or goes below 200, you will cavitate this oil. What happens when you have a pressure imbalance? You end up with oil degrading like instantly. 
in, in 100 miles, you could destroy the oil in that shock. You end up with a ride quality that's horrible. You could bottom the vehicle out. You could have all kinds of uncontrolled uh, movement in the suspension because you're, you've got cavitation going on. You've got oil temp is going to skyrocket and go through the roof. When you start tearing molecules apart and putting them back together uh, with vacuums, it, it ends up with a lot of temperature issues. Another thing, too, you can overpressurize certain zones inside the shock. And if your pressure imbalance leads to a pressure, an overpressurization, for instance, you get these pressures up in this um, shock body head up above 3,000 PSI, say 4,000, 5,000 PSI, you're going to see shock bodies balloon. You're going to see bypass tubes balloon. You're going to see uh, seals blow out. You're going to see a ton of stuff fail on that shock. So pressure balance is super important. Um, most shock guys, like your, your, norm, your favorite tuner in their garage, they're not going to know what that is. The reason that they don't is you need a shock dyno to be able to test this stuff. And pretty much nobody's got a dyno that is in our industry unless it's us, Fox, maybe King, Bilstein, stuff like that. So you have to always, as we are tuning us personally, not, uh, not knowing how everybody else does it, but let's just say us personally, when we go and take a vehicle and we do and go through the tuning process and, and set it up for the dunes and set it up for racers and set it up for cruisers and set it up for you know, old guys with a ton of accessories that drive slow, we have all these setups. They're verified on dynos to give us the idea and give us the, give us the proof that we have pressure balance within the system that isn't going to destroy parts, isn't going to uh, fail your weekend, isn't going to cost you a ton of money. And uh, a lot of times when pressure imbalances are in shocks, and somebody else has tuned it and they blow up a shock and they're like, hey man, you shouldn't have jumped off that. Well, it may not have been your fault. You need to think about that when you're choosing somebody that's gonna do your shock work. They should have the tools to verify what they're doing. Pressure balance, super important. Most shocks are designed to hold and function around 3,000 PSI. As soon as you get over that into the fours and fives, you're gonna see some damage. Um, one of the shocks in particular that I remember, and I know Mitch does too, when we first started doing stuff, uh, was uh, the, the Walker Evans XP900 rear shocks. They were about this long with like six or seven inches of travel max, and they were trying to slow down a fully weighted UTV. And the bridge on that shock would balloon under, the, under pressures um, from bottoming it all the way out. We've seen it stock, like literally stock valving on that one. That was a particular, like that, that was that way originally from the factory. For a long time too. Yeah, they left it for years. Yeah. But we would get them in all the time with balloon bridges on them and we wouldn't even change the bridge because the next one's gonna do it too. But you know, things, uh, everybody got, uh, things progressed in UTVs, shocks got better, um, design engineering got better and now the strengths in these systems are, are also that way to control pressures that you're gonna see through normal driving. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't fail it. You do some of this stuff wrong and overpressurize certain zones and you're going to have failures because you're going to have too high of pressures. Mitch. Will the suspension sag if it is low or out of nitrogen? Uh, very little. So uh, 200 PSI will extend the shaft on the shock. On a normal UTV, I would say that's half an inch to an inch of ride height. It's not very much. But yes, uh, when you charge your shocks with nitrogen, every year like we just recommend, unless you have a leak. If, if you've got a shaft leaking or oil on the shock, then you're losing pressure, so you need to check it. But you always pressurize the shock fully extended. You never add pressure to the shock when it's at on the ground ride height and compressed. You wanna jack the car up, shocks and tires are hanging, charge the fronts, do the rears hanging, charge the rears, do it always with the shock fully extended. Otherwise you're changing this volume, which changes the pressure uh, throughout the system and you don't wanna do that. Uh, I think I've kind of covered most of this stuff, right, guys? We've got shaft speeds um, that kind of tell you where some of the obstacles are in speeds and why things like G-outs that usually bottom a vehicle out require some position-sensitive dampening on top of shaft speed or speed-sensitive dampening to, to do a good job. Pressure balance, most people don't know, even know what that is, but it's very important to verify or you're going to have issues, all kinds of oil, ride quality, and temp issues, and uh, possibly shock failures. And then basic knowledge, piston and base valving adds up to your potential dampening. How much can this shock slow you down in a big jump landing? Um, rebound typically is controlled on the piston unless you've got a double adjuster like an X2 shock. And shaft diameter does affect some of the range of adjustments. Um, we talked about bypass tubes and bypass port locations. 
how those can affect a lot of different things, and how we tune those uh, to give you the best ride quality. But remember, it's not just bypass tube porting, it's not bypass tube locations, it's not the piston valving, it's not just the piston, it's not the base valve valving, it's everything that has to work as a whole to give you a shock package that's gonna do what you need for your driving style. Steve. Yeah, um, I believe Premature John wanted us to make an announcement. <laughs> Um, I yeah. just don't remember what it was. He texted us something was, about uh, RIS. Free shipping there RIS you know. back to you, right? Or back to me. So if you send your shocks in for RIS work or for any internal modifications, when we send the shocks back to you, the shipping back to you is free. And that is a Christmas special. We don't know how long we're going to do it, but take advantage of it. A lot of the reasons why people hesitate on sending shocks to us from the East Coast is because of the cost of that stuff getting shipped back and forth. We'll cover how, all that going back to you. So keep that in mind. As we wrap this up, then I wanna tell you guys, thanks for tuning in when it comes to all this shock tech. I uh, know we did not cover everything when it comes to shock technology and some of the terms here. We just tried to go over shaft speeds and the pressure balances, things that are kind of all connected together uh, on this one little subject. We'll cover more stuff, especially if you guys tell us what you wanna hear. We'll do it. We're not scared to tell everybody how stuff works. You know why? Because unless you do this all day and you own a lot of equipment, it's going to be really hard to do it right. So uh, you guys have a really good day. Steve, take us out. All right, guys. If you want to get that free shipping, call us, 623-217-4959. Or if you want to buy anything off our website, go to www.shocktherapyusa.com.